Hello, everyone. My name is Kenny Coogan, and I'm the Education Director and Public Relations Person for the International Carnivorous Plant Society, which is the ICPS. And today we have another exciting behind the scenes tour, this time with Di Flora, which is a nursery in Italy. To learn more about the ICPS, you can go to carnivorousplants.org. And I have very exciting news before we begin the tour. And that is we have our 2024 International Conference time, date, and location all set. And we will be going to the Schönbrunn Palace, which is in Vienna, Austria. The dates are May 24th to May 26th, 2024. And the hosts are the German-speaking Carnivorous Plant Societies, which is three different countries. And uh, we're really excited to be partnering with them. They're celebrating their 40th anniversary, and this will be our 14th international conference. We usually have a conference every other year. In 2023, we had a conference in Japan, and now we have it in Vienna, Austria. We'll be taking 2025 off, and then we will be back at another location in 2026. This would be a great uh, place for you to network and find people who love carnivorous plants from all over the world. We like to host monthly events, and uh, here's some upcoming events that we have scheduled. So get your pencils out and write down these dates. Now, these events, uh, if you want to attend live, you do need to be an ICPS member, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I wanted to also tell you that we have educational, free educational materials for K through 12 classrooms, you can go to our YouTube page our, our, or our website. The first Wednesday in May every year is World Carnivorous Plant Day. And on that day, we post about one video every hour on the hour to celebrate all things carnivorous plants. So we have growers, we have conservationists, we have nursery people from all over the world contributing to this day. If you wanna be part of the celebration, you can send me a email and then we could talk about how you can contribute. If you would like to be a ICPS member, you can register by going to this website that's on the bottom of the screen. And we do have e-members where you don't get a physical copy of our beautiful full-colored carnivorous plant newsletter. And uh, lots of great benefits to becoming a member. One is that you support our conservation and our education initiative. But another thing is that you get access to our seed bank. Our seed bank is from our members, donated by our members. So the seed bank is only as good as the donation. So if you have surplus seeds, I encourage you to send it to our seed bank manager. Something that I'm super proud about is that today is September 1st, and yesterday ended our third annual Carnivores in the Classroom grant. And that is where we provide funds for teachers all over the world to add carnivorous plants to their classroom. And I'm almost positive you can remember the first time you learned about carnivorous plants and you're fascinated by them. And it could have been in a school setting. And that's what we're trying to emulate through the Carnivores in the Classroom grant. If you want to help us fund even more teachers in 2024, you can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate. And uh, that really helps us. The first two years, we were able to fund about 20 teachers. And this year, through networking with a lot of carnivorous plant nurseries and a few individuals from all over the world, we were able to support over 50 teachers this year. And if you want to support that programming or our monthly webinars or other uh, conservation initiatives, you don't just have to give money All right, you could purchase something. So we do have a little store and you can buy tote bags and mugs and t-shirts, a t-shirt like the one I'm wearing. This is an old world carnivorous plant t-shirt, but we have our 2024 uh, t-shirt 
coming up very soon. And this is just to save the date. For 2024, the first Wednesday in May is going to be May 1st. And uh, that's the next really big celebration for Carnivore Swim. And now we're going to go all the way to Italy and see uh, Valerio show off his nursery. Okay, perfect. Hello to everyone. I'm Valerio from the Flora, the, the, the owner and founder of the Flora. I'm here in uh, the Flora um the flora lab um not only lab because here we have the stock house the lab the shipping uh, uh the shipping facility and uh, i'm i would like to start maybe introduce introducing the flora to the to you to new customer to new um, uh, carnivorous plant collectors and uh, um, because maybe some one of you did not know about us uh, the Flora is a company from Italy. Uh, we started as a tissue culture lab and we started producing a, a lot of plants. But of course, we started thanks to carnivorous, our carnivorous plants passion. That is what driven our uh, wishes to build a, a tissue culture lab. In the last years after COVID difficulties and troubles, of course, we focus our business and our production facility only on carnivorous plants because mainly for different uh, two or a couple of different uh, um, uh, factors. And that could be for sure that uh, carnivorous plants has is a collector uh, a collector market uh, in which, uh, of course, we are able to do, uh, we, we have our market. We don't work at third parties, but uh, we have our market. And because, of course, with uh, COVID and all uh, other uh, problems related to the um, economical cr crisis, uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, have difficulties with uh, other customer related the third parties production. And so, uh, we decided to focus uh, ourselves only on production and breeding, uh, breeding and selection of new carnivorous plants. So we don't started our activity here because uh, we started uh, our uh, activity in 2015 in an hour in another facility that is my grandmother, my grandparents' house. And we started there as a hobbyist, of course, starting our uh, first uh, uh, hobbyist laminar flow hood in which we started to do our first uh, experimentations there. Uh, we see that things uh, uh, has started to do, go very well, especially with carnivorous plants. We started to attend uh, to different exhibition here in Italy. And uh, at the end, in 2019, so four years ago, we uh, started and launched officially, officially the Flora, and uh, we started officially and as a professional uh, our activity. Uh, so we have more or less four years of uh, professional activity and uh, five years of hobbyism before uh, before the professional activity, and. Uh, in the last couple of, of years, we were able to establish and to find a, another facility bigger than the previous one. We still have a production facilities, so working under laminar flow hood in the old one that we are we will be not able to see today because it is two or three kilometers from here. And so today we will see, of course, uh, the new facility and the greenhouse. Of course, the tour uh, is as most sense uh, as more sense if we focus everything not only on the shipping uh, and uh, um, in vitro lab, but uh, on the greenhouse. And so we decided to to have um, everything here and uh, to 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 have the live here and to show you how uh, things uh, work at the Flora. Of course, uh, um, I will change the camera to let to show you the the shipping area here we have uh, all the boxes dedicated to to the shipment and so here we pack your parcels and uh, we prepare the box that we 
are going to send all over the world. And uh, of course, we will have also the stock house in which we have the uh, all the, um, the boxes stocked and uh, everything else related to uh, shipping con to, to that helps uh, into the shipments. Here we, we don't have uh, only the shipping facility, but we will have also the osmotic system. And so here we will have our osmotic plant that produce uh, maybe something like uh, 100 liter each hour. And so it's not uh, so big, uh, considering that is uh, an, is the, the smallest industrial osmotic system in the market. But yeah, it's enough for our 1,000 square meter greenhouse because we produce the osmotic water here that uh, is stored in this tank. And from this tank, we will use it for the humidification of our grow chamber and also to uh, fulfill all our tray in the greenhouse. Here we will have the electrical uh, plant. So with everything that is uh, controlled here regarding electricity and uh, different units. Here, what you see is a chemical that helps to uh, dissolve the mineral salt that is uh, um, very helpful to preserve the membrane there of the osmotic system because we have a very, very strong water here. And so the chemical are needed. Of course, then we will have something uh, less interesting, but uh, here we have the, the water with which we wash all the plants for extra European shipment because we should wash them from pit. And so we should have some pressure to remove pit from the root of the plants. And now uh, we can uh, we can go through our more interesting part. And so we can have a tour of our uh, in vitro chamber here, because in the new building, we have built only half part of the lab. So the shipping area will become very soon, I hope, the new lab, because I want to transfer everything here, both growing and processing part, while uh, we have still built it, uh, already built it, the acclimatization chamber that is over there and the in vitro grow chamber that is here. We can we can uh, we we can have a look only from outside of the uh, acclimatization chamber because the Wi-Fi and the internet data uh, is not uh, um, we will not have uh, internet data inside there, but here we have it, and so we can also have a look inside this chamber. Of course, the lighting and uh, everything is completely different. Here we have uh, something like uh, 100,000 plants capacity uh, of uh, tissue cultural plants. We work usually with uh, 50 ml tissue culture flask for in vitro conservation of uh, all different uh, uh, genetic variety and uh, with a glassware tissue culture vessel for uh, production purpose. We are using LED light, very simple LED light with a uh, LED light with a homemade hand uh, sorry homemade design because we designed this um, uh, all the structure that is uh, uh, that you see here in the lab. And so we use a strip LED light, LED light uh, with all the, the system uh, that is controlled in another, in another room, but it's quite easy. So it's not so light demanding. The, the, the tissue culture is not so light demanding because light in tissue culture is... Um, needed mainly to the photo period regulation and have uh, uh, less important roles regarding the light intensity and the um, chlorophyllian photosynthesis because uh, because there are sugars in the medium and so sugars that are present in the medium help of course uh, 
plants to recover energy without uh, too much light. And so this is the reason why light is important more for photo period purpose than for growing purpose. If you have any question regarding uh, the tissue culture growth chamber, please uh, ask me now and uh, I will give, I will show you uh, some different species growing in vitro, but take this time to uh, ask me your doubt and to have a proper answer for from my side. We can have a look at different cultures in vitro. For example, we can start from the bottom. Here we have pinguicola. Pinguicola in vitro, that is quite uh, easy to grow. They form a lot of clamp. They are very easy to propagate, especially uh, Mexican pinguiculas are very easy. Here we have the medusina. Of course, maybe I believe that uh, almost all pinguicola, maybe apart from temperate one, are quite easy to propagate them in vitro. And so no problem at all with them uh, apart for in vitro propagation, in vitro introduction, sorry. That is quite problematic with uh, a lot of plants, not only pinguicola. Here we have uh, Venus flytrap. The most different aspects of uh, Venus flytrap tissue culture the most difficult one are that uh, usually it tends to develop a lot of clumpy plants and uh, we should avoid the formation of too many small plants, helping uh, the formation of bigger plants uh, of better quality. Penny, feel free to uh, interrupt me when you want. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> Valerio, we've got a couple of questions. Um, do, how do you keep track of which plants are on which shelf? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the tracking is of plants uh, in vitro is not so easy, uh, are not so easy because, uh, yeah, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genetic line because also we start from seeds, we start from tissue, we start from... Uh, a lot of different amount of genetic material. And so at the moment, we are simply using an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet with a handmade label like this one. So we simply keep track of how many containers we do of each species. But we are uh, going uh, in the near future to pass through a, um, a barcode labeling system to have an automatic uh, uh, inventory on the computer, on the PC, because it's becoming more and more complex here in vitro since the the huge amount of different plants and variety in a very small spaces. But at the yeah. moment, we are doing everything handmade with the help only of the Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Does deflora mean something? Deflora doesn't mean... Uh, Anything in particular, the, the, the reason of the name is quite, uh, uh, it seems to, uh, to be a joke because uh, we have, uh, uh, we started, um, wait that I turn the camera. We started with another company in early 2014 with another uh, co-owner, with another guy thinks uh, has not gone as desired, so um, has not gone so well. And so we designed the logo with a D <laughs> and uh, we should change the name in maybe two or three hours because we split up uh, um, just before an important event and we should decide a new name in very few hours. And so we have the logo and we should find the something with the D. And so we decided for the Flora and uh, that's the the reason why our name is the flora but also because we don't want to have uh, our name with uh, a carnivorous plant uh, reference inside we want to keep uh, the flora as a, a general name because we love uh, lab and also because we started only with other plants and that are not only carnivorous plants and so these are the two reasons why uh, our name is uh, that one. You said that this uh, room holds one hundred. It can hold one hundred thousand plants. 
Yeah, more one or one hundred and a half thousand plants. And how close are you to that size right now, or that quantity? Do you mean the production of this quantity of plants, or the energetic cost of this chamber, or the total cost? Uh, like how how many plants are we looking at right now? Okay, so now we are looking at uh, maybe one third of the mass of the total production of the plants, maybe 50, um, 50 thousand uh, plant, no more. Uh, because yeah, we have uh, we have had a massive contamination problem the last year, and we have almost more than an half of the chamber that now is used only for uh, stocking vessel, and also because we have always one or two. Um, uh, fifty or seventy vessel that seem that serves only as a contamination check that we produce month by month to check how is going the contamination rate of the chamber. And so we have had a massive contamination problem the last year uh, due to I believe uh, something that we have we did not recognize yet. And now we are doing a huge amount of tests. We have fixed the ozone production and a very strong uh, ozone protocol for all the, um, the chamber in which uh, sterility are required. And so we, we are doing a lot of tests to keep sterility as strong as possible and to prevent uh, that the, the problem of the last year will come back again. So you mentioned contamination and I think Nepenthes are known for having some internal form of contamination. And Re asks, do you have any Nepenthes in tissue culture? Uh, yeah, Nepenthes, but not only Nepenthes, uh, to say the truth. Uh, all the plants uh, that uh, involves uh, rhizome, like also Venus flytrap, uh, but uh, mainly Saracenia, and yes, Nepenthes and Eliamphora, have uh, what is called endophytic bacteria and fungi. And so it's very difficult to introduce, to um, do in vitro introduction of those species because uh, contamination could uh, spread uh, into the tissue culture container also two, three, four weeks, but also after some month from the, um, from the in vitro introduction. And so it's very, very difficult to, to, um, to have them uh, from tissue and it's more easy to have them from uh, from seeds. Here we don't have at the moment uh, an appendix, not because we don't have an appendix in vitro, but because uh, we have uh, in the old facility uh, in vitro grow chamber that is way smaller than this one, but have uh, a low light intensity that is more suitable for species that love uh, low light intensity also in vitro. Because here the intensity is quite strong. For example, we should shade, for example, Drosera, Adele, and Prolifera because there are too much light and plants uh, tend to become too red and to uh, stop growing. And so Nepenthes are in the old uh, grow chamber uh, within other particular growing plants, like for example, Tuberus Drosera that for proliferation purpose prefers to have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of uh, uh, night. And so particular cases are growing in another grow chamber. Topaz asks, do you have a preference for vessel size or does it, or is it just so you can fit as many as you can on the shelf? Uh, no, uh, at the beginning we should, we, we used the, the um, cheaper, and uh, the one that uh, is uh, most uh, uh, that are most easy to manage in our autoclaves in our uh, sterilization process, that was the plastic container. This one, because they are easy to place one over the other. They are small. They are vented. But at the moment, we found out that uh, plastic uh, also this type of container is suitable only for uh, one use while if you want to um, wash them and use for uh, multiple cycles is uh, is very better to use glassware they are easy to wash they are stronger and they are easy to clean they are they have uh, they are more clean 
and uh, way easier to clean and to prevent the contamination when you use more time. It's way better glassware, I believe. So from the last year, we have done maybe 10 or 15 different vessel trials, and we decided to use the better one for contamination purpose. So at the end, I believe that the tissue culture lab should, uh, if you want to, if he wants to be as professional as possible, should use uh, the best vessel for contamination, for not contaminating the culture. Also, if it means uh, reduce a little bit the production and uh, increasing a little bit the cost of the production process. All right, uh, Valeria, we got two more questions about tissue culture. Patricia asks, do you need to wait for a certain point in the life of the donor plant before you can put it in vitro? For example, can you take like hibernacula in a sundew or can you take a pinguicula that's in hibernation with its uh, succulent leaves? This is a very nice question because uh, the, the, um, the answer is uh, most of the time, yes. So for every particular plant species, there are um, organs that is better for in vitro introduction than other. And so sometimes it's uh, way better to wait the, um, the best uh, organs. And when I talk about organs, it means that, yeah, I know that, for example, leaves are, are almost always present on the plants, but uh, in dormant plants, for example, uh, fresh leaves are, um, are uh, vigorous only in the growing season. Or for example, in Venus flytra, the best part for starting in vitro propagation are flower stalks. And so you should wait uh, the spring of each year to have the best uh, uh, rate of uh, success in in vitro propagation using that uh, tissue culture, uh, that, uh, that the flora stalk. Of course, you should choose the part that is first of all more regener regenerative. So it should be the part that is more easy to introduce in vitro and you know it or checking on bibliography or testing by yourself. So for example, flower stalk of Saracenia are uh, completely not regenerative from uh, uh, in vitro point of view. And so it is not useful like the one of Venus flytrap. And of course, the second um, more important thing is to select the part of the plant that is more easy to sterilize, that is the, that is the main issue in tissue culture. And so um, flower stalk are uh, grow in the very far away from the rhizome, so from the pit, from the ground, and it's more, way more clean than all the part that is inside the ground that have a microorgan, a, 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 a way richer amount of microorganism regarding the upper part. So, for example, Saracenia is a nightmare because the only part that is uh, uh, outside the ground are the leaves and the flower stalks that are almost no regenerative in vitro. And so, yes, there are some parts that is better than the other. I will say no, the hibernacula or other um, store uh, part that is used for storing energy during winter because they are almost always near the ground. But uh, as far as, uh, as distant as, um, so the part that is more um, far away from the ground is the, mo the, most, uh, the most important one from tissue culture purpose. All right, the last question about tissue cultures. Perfect. It's a good segue. Karn Collective asks, how long from start to finish to grow out Venus flytraps from tissue culture? That is another nice question because uh, uh, it uh, helps us to underline how, how difficult and how long is our work because of releasing a cultivar or a Venus flytrap of any type. Because of course, uh, if we start from a well-known cultivar, so for example, from a, a Venus flytrap that has already a name, 
we take uh, two at least two years from the in vitro introduction from uh, to the releasing of that uh, uh, cultivar into the market because uh, in vitro introduction can take up to six months and then we need the uh, um, propagation step acclimatization and then selling while if we started for example from uh, seeds of uh, of uh, one of our breeding program we should do uh, another year or two of testing because uh, we propagate five or ten plants for each uh, genetic selection. We should acclimate and let them grow till an adult size, evaluating them. And if they are good enough, we start again uh, propagation. And so it took more or less four years from when we started. And so that's why we are almost... Um, now out uh, into the market with a lot of cultivar from 2019 because uh, two uh, two years is passed from uh, one of our first massive uh, in vitro introduction and four years uh, or almost also five to six years with Saracenia from when we started from seeds with the Saracenia we are selling right now. All right, very good. I think we're excited to see the greenhouse. We're excited so, to see your four to six year work. Okay, so we can go into the greenhouse. I will, I I want to share with you also some uh, uh, small part of our acclimatization grow chamber, just to give you an idea of the whole process. Because uh, I cannot go inside because we I lost the internet collection, but here. I have the acclimatization grow chamber that is made inside, so under LED light again, with temperature and humidity that is controlled, that are controlled. And here we have the, uh, the second step after in vitro tissue culture. Usually there are acclimatization, here we acclimate almost everything. Also, if in the good season, we can acclimate uh, easy plant like Venus phytrap or Saracenia directly outside. But for example, for Nepenthes and some parts, some type of Drosera is, uh, are almost impossible. And so we should acclimate them here for at least one or one month and a an half and then place them outside the under shady conditions. So usually we prefer to keep here also Venus flytrap for at least two weeks to avoid uh, any possible stress before placing them outside under shady conditions. So here uh, are where we grow Nepenthes during winter and where we acclimate uh, all our plants. It's not so small here. It's almost the replication, only a little bit smaller of the room we were looking just a few minutes ago. And uh, yeah, here is the acclimatization chamber. 24 degree all the year with uh, uh, all the parameters that are controlled and uh, of course uh, stable to help the acclimatization process. Now we are going outside into the greenhouse. And so here you can see the track with which we go to the different exhibition. And from this point of view, you can have a look at our old greenhouse. Uh, in uh, here, you can see the our former greenhouse. We started only with this that have uh, more is more or less uh, a little bit uh, less than three hundred square meters. We started with this. Uh, 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 opening the company, so in 2019, using only collected rain water here. Now it is almost empty because we are starting uh, Spanium moss project for growing that from growing Spanium moss in shade, and also because we are uh, planning to build here in the future a uh, tropical greenhouse for Nepenthes. <laughs> But uh, also thanks to the financial support of uh, Italy, because uh, for young farmers, if you mm, are going to uh, up upload uh, in the 
a nice project. You can uh, earn financial support if, if you win it. We won uh, one of the um, one of the project uh, uh, some years ago, and thanks to the to the um, grants, we are were able to build this uh, bigger greenhouse that is more or less a little bit less that uh, than one. Uh, uh, hundred one thousand square meters in which we grow all temperate species using only osmotic water. Here, entering into the greenhouse, you can see the setup of uh, uh, our exhibition. We usually uh, set up the um, ex exhibition display here to select the best plants uh, for every shows. And then uh, the bigger tank, uh, the big tank of uh, 5,000 liters that we use as a storage system to watering automatically all the trays. There are 34 growing trays in the greenhouse here. And uh, yeah, now we are in, uh, in an advanced uh, uh, season of the year. So we have sold uh, a lot of our plants, but we have... Uh, quite a nice amount that are still left. Usually, uh, as you know, we started in 2019. And so, and uh, uh, one important thing that I want to explain, looking at uh, my greenhouse and to the fact that uh, we have very few big plants, uh, maybe in, those, in that part. The reason why we have very few big plants is that uh, we decided to... Uh, certify our company as 100% uh, uh, sorry <laughs> we would like to we wanted to certify our company for extra European shipment and to do that we should uh, prove our phytosanitary department that we produce everything from tissue culture and so we we have uh, we had the uh, um, take apart all our mother plants and we started from zero from seeds, uh, tissue and organ culture in vitro. And so these that are you are looking are the very first plants that we started in vitro in 2016, 17, 18 and they are reaching the adult size right now. So that's the reason why we have mainly young plants. So we started mainly from zero and from tissue culture. Uh, wow, in which way are we managing the, the greenhouse? Usually we are keeping uh, the very first tray of the greenhouse in uh, with uh, all the plants of our collection in alphabetical order to help us to take plants from orders, for the orders, for, for the e-commerce orders. And so we have a uh, e-commerce part that is the first one on the left and then a production part in which there are a bigger amount of each plants um, for uh, production purpose also in alphabetical order but of course uh, uh, we are uh, not using this part uh, for uh, e-commerce but only for grow the plants and to fill the e-commerce part where uh, that cultivar uh, is ending for example we have also some plants that we kept for the um, for the shows, for the exhibition. So when we come back uh, from every exhibition, we keep the plants for the next one. Here we are going into, we, here we can look at some plants that are, for example, acclimated from a long time. And uh, as you can see, we have very clumpy plants, a bigger one, plants that have suffered a little bit uh, the very warm weather that we have here in Italy. Because here in Italy, we have uh, July and August that have uh, almost 40 degrees. So Venus phytrap suffer a lot, the very warm weather, while uh, very freshly acclimated plants that are locally stunningly good like this one red moon trap because when you acclimate a plant uh, freshly he has a, such a, a strong vigor 
and a strong uh, uh, health condition that uh, can um, that grow for the first months very very healthy and did not suffer any any warm or uh, a strong con or difficult condition this is for example carbonia ardenti just acclimated in full color and full uh, health these are other venus fly trap and i want to show you for example the uh, color of our wine mouth just uh, uh, four months after acclimatization that are almost black and so i i heard a lot of people saying that uh, uh, the freshly acclimated plants uh, is not healthy and yeah from my personal experience instead i should say that the most healthy plants are the freshly freshly acclimated one because uh, they have a vigor and uh, a growing pattern that is absolutely absolutely unique maybe due to the fact that they are uh, completely uh, without any microorganism inside and so they are in full health i don't know but in the in the first six months after acclimatization, plants are incredible. And so the the problem could arise in the year after the in the in the year after when you are facing the long term grow uh, cultivation of the plants because you should manage your potting and everything else very very good. But the first month of uh, after acclimatization, you can grow them how how you want and they are very very vigorous in any condition and so here we have some freshly acclimated plants and uh, our very first selection of saracenia here the pink uh, this is a pink variety that is uh, is uh, going to be appreciated a lot from the market in fact we have finished almost all plants from this selection some very nice alba selection here that is very nice looking a lot of young saracenia what i like regarding in vitro produced saracenia is that uh, they are small but they are clumpy they are pot the, the, the pot are filled with pictures with plants and they are appreciated a lot from the customer also if they are small but what size are the pots the containers okay. yeah yeah i understand yeah then these are we grow and sell everything in 6.5 centimeter pot so quite smaller for the standard of the carnivorous plant world and the 12 centimeter pot for the bigger size so these are the two pot size we are using at the moment 6.5 and 12 centimeter round pot here we have the very first uh, adult plants from our um, from our collection from our tissue culture selection of 2016-17 some hurricane creek white hybrid some adult plants here we are waiting for fall season so for leucophila to sprout out at their best of course, we have uh, something like one or two only mother plants that we use only to evaluate the plants that we have in vitro and to decide if you if we need to produce them them in large in large amount or not. So we are selecting some very nice black throated or red throated saracenia. This is the painted black, so one of the our most appreciated plants that in spring especially it forms a very very a deep white pictures with a, a almost black throat that is painted till almost the end of the lips this is the painted black we have still some planting plug here that as you see saracenia have not the problem of venus flytrap with such a small amount of pit cube it is able to grow at this size so if you are going to take some uh, measurement of uh, plants to grow in uh, small plug 
or plant grow in 6.5 centimeter pot, they are almost of the same size. And almost also they are of the same size of the one grow for three or four months in the 12 centimeter pot. So yeah, Saracenia definitely have not the problem of Venus flytrap regarding warm or too hot condition during summer. Here we have, for example, some nice selection of Wilkerson White Knight crossed with uh, Leo Wilkerson. We have also some very nice selection of red throated that this is the, the first, we can say medium sized production of plants with red throat that we will present at the Nancy meeting in France this year. A lot of other Alba. This is the whitest Alba we have in our collection. And we were able to select them also in vitro and so to propagate them in medium range. But uh, um, regarding also the, the topic we were talking at the beginning, dear Kenny, I should say that uh, Saracenia uh, or Leucophila with poor Alba feature is very is less appreciated from the standard public uh, from the standard customer than uh, the red veined one or better the pink uh, the pink uh, colored one so yeah color is, is much appreciated than poor white uh, in the leuco at least from the general market here we have some nice purpura that is the hybrid we are selling on our website and some nice selection of Bocasa crossed with uh, Leo Wickerson. I don't know if the Bocasa is quite researched there in the US, but uh, in Europe is uh, one of the most researched leucophila. And yeah, this is maybe our fourth mother plant. Here we are selecting for different reasons. So white and red rooted one for collectors. This is a very strange Brigleriana with a trap that is not even able to open. Quite a very strange cultivar, but very big. And uh, some other very nice red throated hybrids. Of course, we are focusing on the hybrid that we are able to have in vitro because uh, uh, we need to produce a little something like at least uh, one or two hundred um, plant for each uh, variety. Here we have uh, we are testing some um, plants instead for the general market. So some plants for wholesale but potted. But to say the truth, at the moment we are not so much interested in this type of market because. Uh, uh, as we said, uh, uh, the market of reference is the Netherlands ones. And uh, yeah, it's quite difficult to compete with prices with the general market uh, and the market of the garden center or, and uh, something like that. But, and also, yeah, um, we have not uh, the that section ready on the website. And so, of course, we are only taking contact from the people that contact us using email or standard form. And this stand here, we have the um, wholesale section, just freshly acclimated plant, just out from the acclimatization chamber. This is the freshly acclimated Venus flytrap, the very first of the year, because we have some delay due to the contamination issue of the previous one. And this is the old one. As you can see, Venus flytrap has the problem that if you don't change and the, the, the media from one ear to the other one, they start to suffer a little bit. The rhizome uh, will stay healthy, but the uh, not uh, all plants will grow very, very well. When you repot them, they start sprouting a lot. And so it's only a problem of the plants uh, in tray and then when you repot them they start growing as crazy but yeah this is a pro this is a problem that we have with venus flytrap we should repot them every year every year every year and it is a lot of work why with with saracenia and rosera it is this 
don't don't happens we we see in fact that the venus flytrap has the problem that it suffers a lot the warm weather and also the staticity of the medium so if you keep the pit media fresh year by year the plants will grow a lot better than if you keep the plants always on the same volume pot and that's uh, also something related uh, an issue related to the uh, growing condition in tray this is some stilidium that is flowering as crazy there are a huge amount of flowers on the stilidium tray and some drosera we are also do uh, we are also doing some test with uh, tuberous drosera because we are testing some growing media in vitro to induce tubers formation or proto-tubers formation. And we are testing right now if these tubers generated in vitro um, is healthy and generate new and healthy plants. We are testing it with a browniana, hirsuta, that is quite easy because it is an erect growing tuberous drosera, murei, major, and uh, a lot more plants. We have, oh, a nice collection. we have a nice collection of tuberous drosera in vitro, but uh, the problem, especially with a flat growing tuberous drosera, is that uh, it's almost impossible to acclimate uh, a growing plant in pot and to have uh, and to give a full growing a full growing season and to make them to form again a tuber a tuberose the year after and so we should for uh we should pass through the production of tubers in vitro and this is the main difficulties on propagating some tuberose drosera you can you buy that or did you have to make it oh i i buy them because uh, there are uh, some companies that are producing these tables so they are uh, co they are commercial uh, growing tray that you find in the market. I buy from uh, um, an old company that has closed and uh, was selling all these 34 tables. And uh, I buy them all used because, uh, yeah, they are also cheaper. And, uh, yeah, it's quite... Uh, they are quite uh, useful. Maybe they have not uh, so much water storage because they have uh, something like uh, four, three, four centimeters of water, no more. But yeah, at the end is enough when you are growing plant uh, when you are growing um, plants in uh, small pot uh, like we do. And as watering system, we use uh, quite an automatic uh, system in which. Uh, uh, the, the, the water level regulates the possibility of uh, fill or not fill the, the tray. And so it's quite easy. And we have also uh, fixed the tables here so they don't move in the part that uh, is thinking to be dedicated to the e-commerce. While in the production area, they can be also moved. So for example, you can save a lot of space because you have at least more or less two or three tables more with this system than with fixed uh, tables. And so, yeah, at the end, uh, we are satisfied with this system, but the, the improvement with which we are most satisfied this year, we spend a lot of money, but with the hot sun and hot weather of uh, uh, North Italy, it has been necessary is the, sh the automatic shader that now is uh, um, grouped, so it's uh, open. But when the uh, temperature will go um, over 30 degrees and the looks, uh, so light intensity, um, go uh, over 50,000 looks, the shader closed and we have 50% shade of the in the greenhouse. And yeah, we have lost uh, no one, uh, we have uh, we have no loss color in our in our plants. And so uh, light intensity here in Italy is maybe too much. And uh, with 50% of shade when temperature is high is perfect for our plants. Can 
Collective asks, what percentage shade cloth do you use after moving your TC plants into the greenhouse? Yeah, to say the truth, we are not using any different condition than the, the other plants. I'm going to show you how it closed. Now I I closed the, the um, I'm closing the shader and uh, what's happening when I uh, remove plants from the acclimatization chamber I will place them outside as uh, the tray we are looking here and uh, they during summer they have a full sun in the very first hours of the morning and in the very last hours of uh, the day because the light intensity is not too much. And they have they are 50% shaded when the light intensity are over 50,000 lux. So these are very fleshly acclimated plants. For example, plants that are acclimated uh, one month ago, no more, and they are all here in the same condition of the, the other plants. So maybe of course, it's the role of the acclimatization chamber. So the plants are already acclimated to uh, outside the, or um, not perfect condition. But uh, yeah, the easy plants answer very well to, um, to these conditions. Really? Now you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either side. Drew asks, what material do you have on the floor? On the floor, I have. Uh, we don't know. The, yeah, it's only uh, small rocks uh, for the ground, and then um, I don't know the the word in English, but uh, it's uh, something like a shader that is a black shader, but place it in the ground to avoid the, the grass formation. But we have. Uh, it's very simple. It's uh, uh, a. a a small rocks basis and then uh, the, the this shader like uh, um, I don't know the, the the word but yeah I yeah. I hope you understand <laughs> yeah like a weed cloth or construction cloth yeah, yeah. it's uh, we we don't use anything particular but uh, if not uh, uh, small rocks to avoid the too many grass formation and this uh, and this shader on the ground that helps uh, more to avoid the grasses formation but anything else in particular maybe uh, it will be better to um, use a more solid uh, basement but uh, at the end we decided to do something like that paper too All right, okay. uh, Valeria, we got we have about ten minutes left. Okay. But uh, Karn Collective asks, "What protocols do you have in place to avoid pests?" Yeah, to say the truth, with uh, tissue cultural plants, uh, uh, we have not uh, too many pests to control at the moment. Uh, uh, we use uh, we use uh, some different uh, uh, chemicals, um, but very very few treatment each year. We use the the um, epic uh, for the aphid and for uh, uh, meadow bug control, and uh, we use. Uh, uh, Borneo from the um, spider mice, maybe it's the name control, and uh, we use another chemical for some very small pyralids, but inside the grow chamber, because uh, using a lot of spanium moss for acclimatization of Darlingtonia and Nepenthes, uh, we have this problem with this small pyralid that uh, is a parasite that eat uh, the grow point and the roots, so. You did not recognize it uh, <laughs> uh, at the beginning because the leaves uh, seems to be uh, green, but uh, the, the growth point uh, is dead. And so there are maybe uh, 
the main issue in uh, a tissue culture facility like mine is to control uh, parasites and uh, yeah we use uh, maybe two treatment at the beginning of the year and only uh, for each of these problems and only uh, one at the at the end of the summer so right now for the middle bug we saw with the epic because in uh, adult saracenia um, it's better to um to treat again in the at the at the end of the summer just before the leucophila season Lane asks do you use any fertilizer I did not use any fertilizer for the acclimatization of plants. I did not use any fertilizer at all, also in the bigger pots. Uh, as I told you a few minutes ago, the, um, the freshly acclimated plants show a vigor that is uh, just incredible. And so it's not needed absolutely uh, anything else, if not uh, a simple report. We are uh, testing, uh, we are doing some trials for Darlingtonia, and, um, but especially for Cephalotus because from in vitro tissue culture, uh, instead they are very, very, very slow grower. And so we are testing some uh, low uh, and uh, long-term release fertilizer for them, but we are not using at all at the moment on the plants for sale, but only for testing purpose. So, uh, Valario, we have about five minutes left. Is there a specific plant or two that you're most proud of that you want to show off? The red moon flytrap was beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, the red moon fly trap is very beautiful. We have. I think, uh, I think you're famous for the wine mouth, which you already showed us. <laughs> yeah, the wine mouth has been, but it's not uh, a plant that uh, came from our breeding plant. It's from Marcos from Brazil. As uh, so a plant that is uh, some plants that uh, um, Carboni Ardenti is our maybe most famous plant that comes from our breeding programs. And it's famous for for its uh, huge amount of trigger hairs on each of uh, their trap. And uh, but we want I want also to share with you some other thing that is maybe more than um, uh, is a curiosity with which uh, I want to leave you. And that is uh, the huge amount of variation that is generated from uh, in vitro tissue culture. For example, we one of the very first uh, uh, mutation that uh, a lab uh, noticed in its plant is the all red mutation. We have four or five cultivar that is becoming all red, like for example, this hybrid between the six cell and up giant, turning all red from a production of plant that are completely green. And so there are a lot of this type of mutation in vitro, but uh, Something that are quite incredible is also the huge amount of uh, variegation that sometimes happens in vitro from in vitro propagation. And uh, this is, for example, a huge uh, all red werewolf that is almost outstanding. And it's acclimated since March, so they have not so many months from, from in vitro. This is a huge master of disaster, the double trap. Up at Venus flytrap. I don't know if you're able to see the double trap somewhere, for example, here. Then we have one of our plants that is most searched at the moment that I love is the bobbit worm, another mutation that arises from in vitro tissue culture that has weird looking traps. It's outstanding. I love it at the moment. It's my favorite cultivar. I I can't wait to have them in propagation because it's not easy to propagate them. We have also the Azura, that is the all red Schuppenstil, quite nice and also uh, quite rare in cultivation at the moment. We have some very huge plants that is uh, an uh, alien open pollinated. 
I should say that uh, alien crosses, uh, in my experience, uh, it's not easy. So doing alien crossings is not easy to obtain the alien feature on the on the on the sounds produced from their crossing, but uh, the the feature that is most easy to propagate is the huge size of almost all alien seedlings that arise from uh, from alien plants. Another that I like a lot is the yellow variegated Venus flytrap. I call it uh, uh, the Flora variegata gialla. It develops variegation only when the plants are very, very big. But uh, for example, I don't know if you are able to see from the camera, but this trap is half red and half yellow completely. And so it's one of my favorite variegated plants at the moment. And then there are a lot of small gems that we are going to try to propagate. For example, this one, it's some... Uh, white variegation arising from a centurion and we discovered this plant simply looking every day at the pot and looking at uh, different mutation this is uh, and also the spotty this is i will i will show you the la this is i'm sorry a miss pinback that is produced almost all fused traps i don't know if you see it but they are very very strange Yes. A miss pinback, uh, very mutated. This is a giant kudu that is forming almost all curled trap. And the one that I like a lot uh, is, uh, and it's another feature that uh, develops quite easy from in vitro tissue culture, is the spotted, not the white spotted, but the red spotted feature. And for example, this is uh, a... a, a they have seven Suspiria plants that have developed all spotted leaves. And I'm appreciating it a lot because it's quite, uh, almost all the trap develops uh, these spotty leaves. They are very, very beautiful. And so they are all plants that we are not released yet because we are giving them time to evaluate the new production, the, if the spotty leaves are stable, if they keep the feature year to year. But uh, yeah, when they are ready, this, for example, is almost ready because we are going to release it in the next few weeks. And uh, yeah, we we release them and we, um, we start the process of... Uh, um, we start the process of uh, registering them when the, the feature is uh, particularly unique and we and we believe that uh, a good name and a good register description is uh, needed. All right, uh, Valario, thank you so much for the tour. And people can find more about your nursery on Facebook, Instagram, and then your website. And all of it is D I F L O R A, correct? Yeah, correct. <laughs> I will thank you, uh, everyone who attended this behind the scenes tour live. It was kind of the first one of the, the fall, September uh, year, and we're going to have at least three or four more this fall. And now that my summer is over, we're going to get back to doing this monthly or every couple of weeks. So thank you, everyone who attended, and thank you, uh, Valerio, for the behind-the-scenes tour. And, uh, Valerio, you said you're going to definitely come to the Vienna uh, conference in May, or maybe? No, I believe that uh, I will be there 99%. <laughs> okay, perfect. And everyone else, the uh, ICPS is combining with the German-speaking uh, Carnivorous Plant Association Club, and we will be having our conference in May of 2024. So if you want to see Valerio in person or buy <laughs> plants, save the date. It's the end of May. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Valerio. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society 
or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.